I'm an economist. I've worked very hard for years, dreaming of coming to Pakistan, helping the Pakistan economy grow, a subject that has been discussed very effectively today. Recently, I've been given my wish. I'm now in government, helping plan the economy, and therefore I have this Chinese curse up there. This Chinese curse that says, may you get what you wish for. I seem to have got what I wished for. So the title of my talk is Growing Pakistan. You've had all kinds of ideas today on how to grow Pakistan. What do you expect me to do? What do you wish me to do? This is what I've been thinking about. This is what I want to share with TEDx today. Let me begin with what I'm faced with. I see before me a strategy that everybody is running. There are three prongs to our strategy right now, three things that we are talking about. We think projects. We think development is a set of projects. We think that we should build bridges, roads, energy projects, railroads, dams, etc. We need more projects. That's what we do. We have a mindset and a culture of seeking projects, but then we need a lot of money. Where do we get a lot of money from? We have to go outside looking for money from donors. We are looking for aid, as you might have noticed. Every headline that we get from our leaders is, we've signed an aid memorandum, we've got some more aid, we've got inaugurated a new project. So we're always looking for aid, always looking for new projects. That is what we are faced with. So that's our first rung of development strategy. The second thing that we're always trying to do is achieve mass production. When I talk to any of you, if I ask you a question, everybody would say, we should have more industry, we should have more agriculture, we should make more products. What kind of products? Make more t-shirts, make more shorts, make more trousers, sell them overseas, textiles. At the same time, grow more mangoes, more crops, sell them outside. We are in a mode of producing mass-produced goods. We are still thinking in terms of Model T Fords and in terms of production lines. We give a lot of subsidy to our industry. We have clever schemes for growth. I hear all kinds of clever schemes. Plant this tree and we'll get all kinds of energy. Dig this hole in the ground and we'll find water that will take us through the future. So we have all kinds of clever schemes, but the thrust is mass exports and the thrust is development projects. The third rung to our strategy is starve domestic consumption. Our domestic consumer must not be able to buy luxury goods, must not be able to buy consumer goods. Therefore, we have a program of import substitution. We manufacture cars locally. We protect them very heavily at the cost of domestic consumer. We protect our engineering goods again at the cost of domestic consumer. We stifle retail. If you go outside shopping, you won't find some good shopping malls. You won't find any good things. We feel people, the only use for people is their producers, they're not consumers. So we have a growth paradigm. If you want to grow Pakistan, we only think growth in terms of growing them as producers, growing them in terms of building infrastructure and projects. Now that's a very interesting paradigm. Pakistan has not grown very rapidly. Pakistan is not an East Asian tiger. Pakistan is not an elephant or a dragon. Pakistan does not grow very fast. It grows sporadically, it grows for five, six, seven years, then we have a recession, we come down very rapidly. Our poverty numbers don't seem to improve. What should we do? Our planning paradigm, these three ideas that I gave you, aid funded donor projects, mass production, and starve the consumer. These three ideas have not delivered development for us. We are still trying to push development with this narrative of three, these three ideas. Push industry and production and starve the consumer. There are some innocent byproducts of this paradigm. Where do we get ideas for products? Our ideas for products mainly come from watching overseas. We see a nice highway overseas, we see some nice project overseas, people are doing, doing IT. We should also start doing IT. Donors are asked by us to design our projects. So they, we have, in a sense, outsourced our own thinking. We are not generating our own thoughts. We are outsourcing our thinking. 
Meanwhile, what is the government doing? Because we've outsourced our thinking, government has become transactional. What does that mean? Government is thinking only of projects, going from project to project, and not really thinking of conceptual things. So policy now has become a series of projects, and we have to be careful on that. What is happening as a result? We are be becoming very good mimics. We are mimicking what the West has done. We are doing everything that the West has done. If they build something, they build social protection, they build, um, you know, they build social protection, they build model villages, they build some kind of a new system for watching cities or whatever, we try and copy that. What is, all, what is wrong with all this? The fact is that we cannot innovate if we mimic. We are only mimicking. We need to innovate. How do we do that? Okay. Very briefly, this is our development discourse. Our development discourse is build projects, protect, um, sorry, build projects, develop mass production, starve the consumer, follow the donor, mimic the donor. This is our discourse. Now, why is discourse important? Discourse is important because discourse sets the framework in which we think. Discourse is the framework within which we operate. It is the narrative that all of us are following. That narrative, narrative is projects, aid, and mimic. Now, there are some unintended consequences of this, this discourse. And this is very important to follow. Unintended consequences are what are holding us back. First, government agents, because they've ceased to think, are now not able to produce the quality that is required for good governance. And we are all frustrated with that. We have solutions that we follow from outside, we copy from outside. All we need is implementation. Yet, the implementation, implementation structure remains what we had a hundred years ago. We have not reformed that. The incentive structure of the, of the implementation system is such that the poor bureaucrat who is implementing is cash poor per rich. That has its own problems. All projects come with their own perks. Therefore, all the bureaucrats are invested in projects. So we have a system where projects get reinforced because people get perks from their projects. The second uh, unintended consequence of this paradigm, of this form of thinking, is what I call a premature overload. What does a premature overload mean? Pakistan has an infrastructure, Pakistan has a per capita income of $1,000. If you think about it, where does that place us? The U.S. had a per capita income of $1,000 well before the Civil War. So we are at the level of development where the U.S. was before the Civil War. Yet, what is expected of us by the, by the world, by the donors, is far more. They want us to build roads, they want us to build social protection, they want us to build policies for the poor, they want us to build all kinds of new things, a complete welfare state. In the premature overload, we need to build highways, whereas all that is required is a two-lane road. So we are building highways everywhere, rather than worry about building the infrastructure that we need for today. This is the kind of infrastructure that is given to one class of society. Another form of infrastructure is the highways that we have. Now, the premature overload leads us to build Welfare systems for tomorrow, to build suburbia for the rich, to build government, uh, but we do this with a government organization of yesterday. In order to make these premature overload projects, we are creating parallel systems of government. The third unintended consequence of the development paradigm that we have is that we've got cities that are barren of creativity. How are they barren of creativity? creativity? Once we've made up our mind that we want industry only, we don't want any domestic commerce, we don't want any domestic um, sort of entertainment infrastructure or something, we follow the Islamabad DHA paradigm, where what we are trying to do is build these suburban cities with no domestic uh, retail infrastructure, entertainment infrastructure, or mixed infrastructure. There is no public space in these cities, there is no space for the poor, there is no creative space in these cities. This is our paradigm for development. We want four-lane highways, we want flyovers, we want everything. We don't want to cater to this. 
And that is a planning paradigm that we need to change. We also have a fourth intended consequence of our planning paradigm, which is exclusion. We've got lovely suburban cities, as I said, full of golf courses, single-family houses, elite leisure spaces, and indeed a lot of religious infrastructure. But we have no community space and we have no playground for the poor. And that is leading to social tensions, as we pointed out earlier too. The fifth important consequence is we have no intellectual space or space for innovation left. Why? Because we are mimicking, mimicking constantly. We are mimicking the West, we are trying to get um, ideas from the West, we are trying to implement them very fast, so that mimicry is leading to a lack of domestic thought leadership. And we have, as a result, got a very dated discourse of development. The sixth important consequence of the way we are doing things now is, we have no success norm. Our success norm now is no longer meritocratic. We are not thinking in terms of people coming up on merit. People come up because of government licenses, because they are good consultants, or because they have some form of relationship power. Not that they have competed, innovated, developed new ideas, developed new thought. The paradigm is follow that donor. We have a rent-seeking paradigm. What is all this leading to? We have a donor, follow the donor, mimic type approach. We have developed these structures where, are, uh, where we have unintended consequences of uh, um, uh, all these unintended consequences that I pointed out. Where is this leading us to? As I said, growth is not taking off. We are not becoming an Asian tiger. We are not becoming an elephant. We are not becoming a dragon, which is referring to China. We are also seeing a deep sense of frustration in our people. If you look at the survey, people are deeply frustrated and unhappy. And we see this in all kinds of indicators again and again. You have all kinds of indicators in the world which point out how difficult things are. I would like to overlay on this the narrative of the dispossessed youth. If you think about it, 80 to 90% sorry, 80 to 90 million kids, which is 50% of our population, are under the age of 20. These children have little education, little hope, but more importantly, they have little space. They have little space in our cities. They have little space for their community. They have no libraries, no community centers, no playgrounds. Yet we have a number of golf courses. Yet we have all the space for the DHA. What does that mean? These kids are not being socialized. As Wellington said, the Battle of Waterloo was won in the playing fields of Eton. Where are our playing fields? Where are our community space that allows these kids to be socialized and modernized and interface with the globe? Even more importantly, they have no intellectual leadership because we are busy mimicking. We are not innovating. So they have no intellectual leadership, except one. They have community space and they have leadership. Where? It's in the mosque. And that is something we should all think about. So, I come back to my planning problem or my growth problem and thinking about growth. I've just outlined to you where we stand in terms of our thinking, in terms of our thinking, growth and development. We were thinking of growing Pakistan. We were thinking of growing Pakistan economically by building projects, by producing industry, by starving the consumer. But we have several unintended consequences that show that while we were growing Pakistan economically, we retarded the community, we retarded our ability to innovate, we retarded our ability to think. Those things are coming back to haunt us. So what should be my task? My task is, the way I look at it, and correct me if I'm wrong, my task is to change the discourse. How do I change the discourse? What I've been talking about is we've had a very hardware approach to development. 
Our development was building projects, building industry, building this. Everything was hardware. Everything was growing in one direction only. So when I said growing Pakistan, we were growing Pakistan only economically, retarding Pakistan intellectually and community-wise. Now we have to think differently, what I call the software of development. We've done the hardware and not succeeded. What is the software? Software is, let's think productivity. Let's think how productive we are in terms of our asset usage, in terms of a human capital usage. Let's think of how productive we are with knowledge. How do we use global knowledge? How do we use our knowledge? Let's define a new success norm, which is innovation and entrepreneurship, not rent-seeking, not running after the government or the donors. Let's develop this new software, which requires a tolerance and an acceptance of modernity. And truly, there is no development without acceptance of tolerance and modernity. Let's accept that. And let's accept that our cities must be a space for creativity. They are not just an upside-down suburbia. They are a place for creativity. Let's create the necessary city centers and things to uh, allow creativity to happen. So, how will growth and development happen? Growth and development will happen once we allow ideas and knowledge to happen. Once we allow a modern discourse to happen, once we begin to search for innovation and creativity. This is my new task, the way I look at it, and you can tell me if you think that I'm not on the right track. And this is why I would add why I decided to sponsor TED. Because TED is all about modernity, technology, entertainment, and design. And these are the new areas that we must all focus on, and if we do not, then do not look surprised Pakistan doesn't grow. Thank you very much.